Welcome everyone to this session titled Evolving and Emerging Trends in HER2 Classification and Reporting in Breast Cancer. Uh, my name is Joe Kim and I will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, today's faculty. Uh, so today's faculty, uh, you can see their disclosure up here, uh, but we've, we have Dr. Bui as well as Dr. Bascoda and Dr. Shivakula. And I would just ask each of them to provide a very brief introduction. Uh, so if we could start with Dr. Bascoda. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, I'm Sikriti Baskoda. I'm currently. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, I'm I'm Sikriti Baskoda. I'm currently the assistant professor at Columbia University Medical Center. I practice both cytopathology and surgical pathology. Hi, I'm Dr. Marilyn Bowie. I'm a practicing pathologist at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. I've been there for 17 years doing biomarker testing, especially HER2, uh, just intertwined with my professional development. So I'm very excited to be here and share knowledge with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kim. My name is Mamata Chivakula. Uh, a lot of pathologists uh, think that I'm a part of a hybrid model. So uh, I moved from academic practice from University of Pittsburgh to come back home in Bay Area. I serve as a director for breast pathology services and immunohistochemistry lab in Northern California. And we're just five minutes away from our hospital as part of the huge Sutter Healthcare system uh, in San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> Great, thank you. So we have a very interactive discussion uh, that's planned for today. Each panelist will give a very short presentation uh, and then we're gonna have some dialogue back and forth. We also wanna hear from you and hear your questions because clearly a lot has been happening in the HER2 landscape when it comes to breast cancer. Uh, I wanna remind you that today's session is being recorded and also live streamed. Uh, so when you do come up to ask your question, please make sure you come up to the microphone, introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, and so, so without any further delay, I'm gonna have Dr. Bascoda come up and give her presentation and then we'll go along each presenter and then have the panel discussion towards the end. Thank you, Dr. Kim. First of all, just a general question to the audience here. How many of you are familiar with the new term that is trending right now, her to love? Raise your hands, please. Thank you, that's a quite a few number. So today, um, basically, I'm gonna talk about what coded this term, this, this, um, um, and the trial, which is, again, trending, Destiny Breast 4 trial, the milestones of the new drug, Trastuzumab deroxtican, and what does this actually mean to the pathologist and why we are talking about it. And then we will delve into her to low and the challenges for pathologists in the identification of this particular category. So uh, Destiny Breast 4 actually followed after a few uh, Destiny trials, which is a phase three randomized control trial. Uh, the cohort included metastatic breast cancer patients who previously received one or two lines of chemotherapy, but had recurrence within the six months of the initial treatment therapy. Uh, it also included HER2 low, which was described as immunohistochemistry one plus or two plus with I ISH negative or FISH negative. And total cohort included 557 patients. I'm gonna focus mainly on the hormone receptor positive cohort, which is uh, characterized by either ER or PR positive. Uh, and they were 88.7% uh, of the cohort. It, uh, they were subdivided into two is to one as a randomized. And half of the, uh, two, uh, two is to one, and they received either the trastuzumab deroxtican or a physician choice of chemotherapy. And this article was published on July of this year in New England Journal of Medicine. So as you can see in this image, um, in these two groups, the patients who received the new drug, trastuzumab deroxtican, has a significant median prog progression-free survival of 10.1 month when compared to the physician choice of cytotoxic chemotherapy, which is 5.4 month. Similarly, for the overall survival of this hormone receptor positive cohort, the trastuzumab group had a median of overall survival of 23.9 months, and the physician choice had the overall survival of 17.5 months. So what is actually this drug? This drug is a conjugate of a monoclonal antibody, which is the trastuzumab, and a cytotoxic drug, 
uh, deroxtecan, and it is given as an IV infusion. Trastuzumab helps identify this drug to any cells that expresses HER2. Then it helps deroxtecan to cross the cell membrane into the cytoplasm, which helps in de uh, destroying the tumor cells, even with a very low uh, HER2 expression. And it also kills the nearby tumor cells by a bystander effect. So talking about the uh, timeline for trastuzumab, it started in uh, December 2019 for, with the Destiny Breast 03 trial, followed by Jan 2021 with the Destiny Grastric 1. So you can see that it has been uh, you, uh, tri trialed in various other cancers as well. And with now, in August 2022, we have a full uh, FDA approval of uh, uh, trastuzumab deroxtecan for the use of unresectable or metastatic her 2 low breast cancer treatment. So let's come to the, our real question. What does this actually mean for the pathologist? Before that, let's visit the ASCO CEP 2018 guideline for HER2, um, HER2 reporting. So HER2 testing for the invasive component should be done in, by validated immunostain, and the batch controls and on-site controls so, should show appropriate staining. Any case can be reported as uh, three plus if it shows the circumferential complete membrane staining, which is intense and at least accounts for greater than 10% of the tumor cells, which should be visible even in low power. The weak to moderate complete staining observed in greater than 10% of the tumor cells is classified at IHC2 or equivocal, and we must reflect the FISH study or other new tests, including both, either immunochemistry or in situ hybridization. If there is an incomplete membrane staining that is faint or barely perceptible and um, accounts for greater than 10% of the total tumor cells, then it should be reported as one plus. If there is no staining observed or the membrane staining that is incomplete or faint or barely perceptible in less than 10% of the cells, then we report that as immunostic uh, IHC zero. So here is a pictorial example. To your left is the IHC zero where you can faint, you know, like not even appreciate the complete membrane staining of HER2. The second picture shows some incomplete parcel staining, which was reported as one. And here you can see there is at least like weak to moderate, almost complete in few of them, which was scored as two plus. And here there is intense, uniform, homogeneous positivity, which was reported as three plus. So there has been a lot of concordance in between the pathologist while, com while it comes to reporting between the two plus and three plus category, but however, the same doesn't hold true for zero and one plus uh, category. And it will be talked about with uh, our other expert panel panelists to follow. So the challenges that we are facing is, prior to this HER2 low clinical trial, there was very little clinical applicability for reporting the immunostochemical scores of 0, 1 plus, and 2 plus, where HER2 was called negative, including the negative insight to hybridization study. But now, HER2 low trials requires us to comment on the specific immunostochemical uh, scoring. So with the invent of the HER2 low cancer category, Anything with the reflex immunostain negative or uh, plus one or even the plus one comes to the HER2 low breast cancer category, which actually is reported in up to 45 to 55% of the core breast cancer cohort. HER2 positive accounts for 15% of the cohort, and the HER2 negative accounts for 30 to 40% of the total breast cancer. nervous system, we cannot function. That's pathology in the laboratory medicine's role in patient care. So we're going to focus on uh, IHC zero versus one plus the diagnostic challenges. Before our job was a little bit simpler because we are tasked to identify the HER2 positive patients that they are IHC three plus or IHC two plus with the fish amplification. Now with the HER2 low patients, we know a drug is effective to treat them and we know biologically they show characteristic pathological uh, clinical features. Are we able to distinguish one plus and zero? Let's talk about this. Before we do the interpretation, we know our job composed of three parts. First is to collect the specimen correct stain them correctly so we provide the quality staining for pathologists. That's step number one. There are a lot of pre-analytical factors. We'll 
impact on the staining quality that is presented to pathologists. Second is pathologist interpretation. The criteria is right there, identified crystal clear by the ASCO and the CAP guideline. And it was described very clearly where's the cutoff. However, in practice, are we able to do that accurately, reproducibly? That's very important. The third step is how do we report it? The ASCO guideline asks us to report three plus, two plus, one plus, and zero very discreetly. However, there are still laboratories only report HER2 negative without specifying zero or one plus. That was forgivable before the HER2 low change of the uh, paradigm. But now in the new practice, we have to be able to reliably distinguish zero versus one plus versus two plus, that is fish not amplified, versus completely HER2 negative. So let's talk about the complicated tissue journey. Tissue come from the patient, and there is a cold ischemic time, there is a fixation issue, and when you stain them, what antibody platform you're using, it's all making a very different. So there is a lot of variability, so we all have to work together to solve that issue. In addition to that, so on the right, we talk about all the pre-analytical factors, including the cold ischemic time, the different assays, the tissue fixation, the staining time, different antibodies, different antibody platforms. The tumor does not make things easier, neither. As we all understand the phenomena of tumor heterogeneity. If you have a biopsy, only shows certain phenomena, most of the time it will represent the tumor, but there are situations the tumor will show different spots. At the periphery may have some three plus tumor cells. In certain areas may have two plus, one plus, or even zero. So we always have to keep tumor heterogeneity in mind. If you have a negative core biopsy, the ASCO CAP protocol asks us to repeat it on the excision or resection specimen. There are other groups that you need to repeat, but if it's negative, you should always repeat. Because this drug is set for the metastatic setting, we know that the tumor a HER2 profile will change from biopsy to resection to the metastatic tumor. So when it's metastatic, you should also test it to give the patient the opportunity to be treated with new targeted therapy. So this shows our job before was binary interpretation, HER2 positive versus negative, relatively easy, but now, we are required to do this to identify HER2 low versus HER2 negative. So this is the challenge. Are we ready for it? So let's review the manual scoring steps. When we have a slide, assuming all the pre-analytical factors were done, controlled correctly, the slides are quality slides. As a pathologist, I will check the positive and the negative controls. Do you realize that there's no standardization in what's put in the control? Before, our job was to identify HER2 positive, so the minimum control is you have a run negative control, you have a patient three plus control on the slide. So if that worked, then you can do your interpretation. However, how about standardize our controls. I see there are certain institutions put patient samples in those four class, very discrete class, zero, one plus, two plus, three plus on the patient sample. So that's a, a very extreme example. They're doing it right, but it's not really reproducible because the patient sample 
it's very scarce, right? And also, how can you run so many tests consistently, keep that, so that's a challenge. I also see there are certain institutions using alternative controls, for example, cell lines or engineering samples. So there are a lot of methodology. So this is a challenge our pathology community. Community has to work together to fine tune in the arrow of her to low, what is the standard control? This is not addressed by the guideline. Maybe this should be addressed when there is more evidence coming up, right? Because the guideline evolving around the knowledge and evidence, so this is one area that I personally believe can be improved. Now when we have the slides, we look at the control correct, we look at the intensity. Uh, first is the pattern, complete or incomplete memory staining. If they are complete, you're talking about three plus or two plus. If they are strongly, that's three. If it's moderate, that's two. Then the second is percentage. The 10% is always the cutoff. However, if they are incomplete, you're talking about the two plus, one plus. And if they're completely negative, so that's zero, however, there is a group of HER2 zero has less than 10% incomplete, faint type of staining. So that become a little bit challenging for the human eyes, right? Because how reliably your eyes can tell 10% of something really, really weak. So this is the area, there is an opportunity, probably quantitative image analysis, and the AI can help us. So when you've gone through all those process, and then you're gonna determine what's the final score, when we're dealing with zero and one plus, you will always have to go to 20X, and then even 40X, and the examine the entire slides following this criteria to make that judgment. However, this is not done yet. As physicians, we don't just get some data and put it in the report. We have to put the score into the situation. Look at this entire patient. Does this score make sense? If it's a well different tumor, if it's triple negative, that does not make sense, right? Because triple negative is the profile of a high grade tumor uh, than the basal type of tumor. So there are a lot of consideration where we practice medicine as a physician, not just report whatever the data is in the laboratory. So when we put all this to work together, we report. And the ASCO guideline recommend us to use the discrete, the four categories to report that, make it very easy for the clinician to read. So because before, we don't have the motivation to separate the zero versus one plus, so we didn't really try very hard, but now we do. So there is a potential opportunity to use quantitative image analysis and machine learning to help us. So this one shows why use image analysis. So that checkboard from the area A to B, if I take off all those tiles, I ask you a question, are they the same color or not? 99% of the people will say they are two different color and shade. One is gray, one is black. However, when you link the tiles all together, you realize A and B is exactly the same shade. Then what's the factor that make us to make this interpretation error? Is that the green column created the shadow, create this artifact? So this is just showing if you use QIA or machine learning, the machine used the algorithm will be able to tell those are the same color and shade. So in that sense, the algorithms, when they designed correctly, validated by pathologists correctly, it can be reliable, measurable, repeatable, and doing the quantitative work that the pathologists desperately need to help us. Because when you calculate 10%, if we have a tool like a calculator to help you, it will be very helpful. We're not worried the calculator will replace us. The calculator just help us, like when you go to the restaurant, 
you calculate the tip, you decide, do you want to round it up, round it down? You want to do 18% or 20%. But without a calculator, it's very difficult to go through those numbers in your mind. So we all agree that if we do little tasks like paying the tip using calculator quantitative analysis to help us, we're dealing with the patient deciding if they're on a treatment or not, we're not asking for help. It just doesn't make sense. So this is not just a theory. There are already emerging studies showing quantitative image analysis will help. This is a publication cited in the College of American Pathologists encouraging the laboratories to use this quantitative tool. So publish this guideline paper to help us to do our job better. And this is a new emerging tool use AI to help pathologists. And uh, when we do this four group of uh, interpretation without AI, there's a poor concordance with the AI, with the machine's help. Pathologist with the AI is an augmented pathologist. You can see the concordance rate is much higher. So when we were doing the bidirectional bi quantification of HER2, we had standardization, we had education, and in the lab we do the CP proficiency testing. With all this, there is an improvement in concordance. Look at 12 years ago in this large cohort, the HER2 positive rate, the concordant rate, was low, the disconcordant was 52.4. The concordance after 12 years is increased. Disconcordance is less than 8.4%. This shows education standardiz standardization make a difference. So with this in mind, I propose more education standardization in the HER2 low era. That will help us to do our job better. So one way of educating the committee is to create resources. So please check out her2know.com. This is a sponsored activity, but non-branded. I am one of the nine faculty that contribute to this. It is free for all. Please use this resource to help you and help your patients. Thank you. So um, I think my colleagues have covered a lot of in important information. And Dr. Joe Kim has asked me to talk about the unusual patterns of HER2 interpretation and the challenges we face day to day. Anti-HER2 agents are currently used as standard of care, both in early stage and metastatic breast cancer. Proper sampling and testing is important to account for heterogeneity at histological as well as the IHC level, a crucial factor in treatment decision. Although CAP ASCO guidelines are established and updated over time, challenges still exist for the pathologist in routine practice. In the tissue type, the biological heterogeneity in metastatic setting, bony versus the soft tissue, et cetera, et cetera. That makes my life every day so busy. <laughs> So uh, the challenges for pathologists regarding the HER2 testing in routine practice, uh, uh, our, my colleagues have test, uh, talked about the pre-analytical factors, analytical factors, and I'm going to be talking about the post-analytical factors. But these are all the challenges every one of you in the breast practice do encounter every day. <clears throat> so uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the HER2 guidelines, how they evolved. You know, uh, when I was trained as a breast fellow at University of Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Dabbs has changed uh, to 4B5 antibody. So we were all jumping with joy, oh, that's 4B5, okay? So that was simple at the time, but it gets complicated over time. And so when you look at the 2007, you know, the, the whole concept of the guidelines, when you look at it, it's the way everything is worded, you know, in terms of circumferential, the terms of 10% versus 30% and how things are. And I still 
if we are not a breast pathologist, I still have people asking me questions. Can you please tell me what two plus means? What is the score? So, you know, uh, you always have to refer to a guide before you're looking at a HER2 stain. <clears throat> So uh, we are now at the 2018 guidelines. So we'll talk about the, uh, what happened in 2018. So the 2018 brought up a lot of important stuff and went much more detail into the HER2 scoring, which I'm really, really happy about. And one of the most important things was that uh, in nutshell, actually it was the focused update of the HER2 scoring, which is the best part. Revision of the definition of 2 plus equal to the original FDA approved criteria from 2007. Repeat HER2 testing on surgical specimen if initially tested on core biopsy is negative is no longer mandated, but uh, I think we are all, we know that if it follows into certain categories, we don't have to retest it, but in our practices in real time, we are repeating the HER2 testing if it's negative. A more rigorous interpretation criteria for the less common patterns can be seen in about 5% of the cases when HER2 is evaluated by a dual probe fish testing or some ish testing. These cases described in the clinical groups of two and four should be assessed using a diagnostic approach, including a concomitant review of the IHC test will help the pathologist to make the final determination of the tumor specimen, either it's positive or negative. Well, this comment is uh, very good and very simple and straightforward, but in practical purposes, just imagine your oncologist is sitting and texting you like crazily asking either on the epic or on your text messages, is the patient positive or negative? All I want to know is, is the patient eligible for therapy? So it's very important, and I think to me, my job has moved from uh, simple comments to now I'm writing up so many comments in my uh, reports. And that's how things have become more complicated and more information is required by our clinicians, and that's where we are heading towards in breast pathology. The expert uh, panel uh, preferentially recommends the dual probe but I'm not going to go into the details of the ish testing. Uh, that's definitely a different mm, talk. So I'm going to go through how things are going to uh, make our lives much more complicated and what questions we'll be getting based on the guidelines. And this is, these are the uh, real-time cases that I had. A 62-year-old patient uh, who was HER2 negative and went through uh, new adjuvant therapy, and this is the lumpectomy that uh, we have received. And you can see that a lot of uh, uh, lumpectomy changes with apocrine features, nuclear atypia, fibrosis, and, and uh, the test, the patient had uh, biopsy done in a different institution, so we repeated the biomarkers. And as you can see, uh, the HER2 starts to have a moderate complete staining pattern and probably equal to about 10%, and the pathologist has uh, interpreted this as 2 plus. And the fish came back as positive, and the ratio was 2, 2.1, but when you go into the details of the fish report, the HER2 signals, uh, average HER2 signals were 3.1, and SEP was 3.0, immediately you'll get a call. So uh, why is this positive? She was negative preoperatively, and why do we have, to, is she positive or negative? What happened? So uh, one of the things that uh, have you noticed with your oncologist when you're having a discussion that they uh, immediately say, oh, maybe it's related to new adjuvant therapy. There is a conversion. No, 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 there's no conversion here. So when we go on to look at the guidelines, you know, it falls into, this, uh, applying the guidelines of the CAPASCO for the new group, you have a HER2 ratio of greater than 2.0, but the average signals are less than four. So based on this algorithmic approach, okay, so what we are seeing is that a two plus interpretation, and you have to, again, go back, look at your fish signals, and do a 20 plus score, and then 
if this falls into the uh, ratio is still 2.0, then uh, your signals are still less than 4.0, you interpret this as a HER2 negative. And then CAP ASCO has nicely given this recommendation guideline what happens to this patient and is interpreted as negative, and they do not respond to uh, a transosmap therapy. So these are all the directions we have to do, this algorithmic, uh, algorithmic approach. And this has to be put into your comment section. You have to text your clinician, talk to them in detail. So another example, a 56-year-old woman presents with a breast mask, core needle was done, and ERPR both were positive. KI67 was 30% uh, and HER2. So, and you look at the histology of the lesion, uh, the tumor, it has its exfoliated pattern. One thing comes to your mind is micropapillary carcinoma. And the new terminology of apocrine micropapillary is also important to recognize because some of these uh, tumors are going to be HER2 positive. So the HER2 immunohistochemistry was done. The pathologist has interpreted this as three plus. So as per the practice, we have sent it out for fish at three plus, and here's what the fish result will come back. Negative, 1.7, and look at the signals is 4.7, and uh, SEP was 3.1. So again, you get a call. Then I go back to look at the case, and one of the striking features is the unusual pattern of the micropapillary, so-called the U-shaped pattern of the HER2 expression featuring a basolateral, almost like hmm, the basolateral staining pattern is described in the GI her twos, and you're looking at the same type of the basolateral staining of the cell membranes. The intensity of the expression can be variable, moderate to intense, just like our hmm, patient here. However, due to the lack of the completeness along the cell membrane, this basolateral pattern should uh, would not fulfill even the criteria of a score two plus. So, but this was called as a three plus, overcalled. Nevertheless, and CAP ASCO recommends that you should call this as a two plus, it reflects it to ish, and because some of these can harbor the HER2 amplification. So uh, these are some of these uh, problems that we encounter with the unusual patterns. Takes longer time to explain in our reports and to our oncologist because there is a patient on the other side who, want, who deserves a therapy or not. So the CAP ASCO acknowledges the presence of staining patterns that are not exactly fulfilling the definitions, yet we need to recognize them and categorize them as two plus in order not to miss an amplified tumor. The unusual patterns are mainly grouped into two categories. Although I'm talking about these unusual patterns, it's noteworthy at this point is that there's no, no literature, hardly any literature on this, and this is where we need this unusual HER2 stuff that we need to have more uh, education sessions on. The unusual patterns can be moderate to intense, but incomplete, or IHC staining can be limited to a bold HER2 expression. So here is an example of a strong HER2 positive staining, but when you look at the entire core, this is uh, towards a focused group of the strong expression pattern. The rest of the tumor is all negative. Then you have di different degrees of intensity in the patterns of the uh, core biopsy. You can see a strong pattern, and then you start to see some areas with the uh, one plus. Then the unusual pattern of a medium to strong intensity, but when you go on the high power, you look at it, and this is an incomplete staining pattern. And some of these areas, you can see that fragmented type of what they describe the membrane is pattern. So these are all important when you're reviewing, and this gets very important when you're starting to recognize this entity of the low HER2 status as well. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, there are two different patterns of heterogeneity that we see with the tumors. One is the clonal or the clustered pattern. When you go on the low power, a clustered pattern is that it's, you see half of the core being negative, and you start to see small clusters of the tumor cells expressing strongly. And then, this is another example. 
This is where you start to see this clonal, uh, clonal or the clustered pattern, which is very uncommon. But the mosaic pattern, which is a mixture of signals, is the most common pattern you get to see on the core biopsies. And the low power, also you start to see signals which are no signals versus a strong signaling pattern of the immunostains that you see. So it all matters where it's cored on the tumor. <clears throat> So in conclusion, evaluation of the HER2 membrane staining in TADS is subject to really breaks down to a human eye perception, particularly 1 plus and 2 plus. This is where it gets very challenging once we start to recognize all these new entities of the low HER2. Subjectivity of the interpretation of the scoring can lead to discordant results among the pathologists or the institutions. This is a personal experience. Uh, uh, we have published a a study from in Breast Journal two years ago with Dr. Aziza Nasser. She is a, a chairwoman at uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. We looked at the HER2 interpretation across the country, and it was very surprising how how regional the differences are: East Coast, West Coast, or maybe it's, and also within the practices, within the same academic practices, or within the uh, practice groups of a one, two versus more than two, and so it's all based on a lot of things, regional as well as within your cancer center, what your oncologists are also thinking, okay? So uh, that subjectivity is there. So um, also, uh, I, mm, there is an interesting magnification rule uh, for increasing the reproducibility of the IHC scoring. And particularly, this gets more useful in the HER2 low category in the near future. So uh, what this, uh, I was very curious about this publication of the magnification rule. Using the different magnifications of the objectives to perform a sort of triage across the scores. It's almost like looking at the hotspots for KI67 being published. Uh, a clear cut intense uh, perceived at a low magnification corresponds to a three plus. And staining that can be appreciated at 10 to 20 percent would more likely fit into a 2 plus. And if you really have to go on to a 40 plus to look for a staining pattern, probably it's a 1 plus. It's something to keep in mind. I would not make it uh, uh, really the way to look at any HER2 imaging analysis, I mean, uh, HER2 staining analysis. So um, uh, these are all the references I have used in my talks. And after a <coughs> a long day of a breast service. You really feel to go back into the mountains for your hiking, and this is a great day at Mammoth Lakes in California. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, panelists. And now we look forward to a panel discussion. Uh, for those of you who have questions that you'd like to ask, we'd love for you to come up to the microphone uh, and ask some questions. Um, and so I think there are some opportunities for us to explore you know, what exactly is going on within your own institutions, as well as implications. As ASCP has worked on these educational programs, one thing we've discovered is that in some settings, you may not do IHC, you may only do FISH or ISH testing, and the question now becomes, what do you do now? Do you, do you bring IHC back, or do you do something else? Uh, so I think recognizing there are regional differences, but also even differences within your own institution. So I see we've got someone. Would you like to ask a question or a comment? Please yes, introduce hi. yourself. I, I'm Dragana Pelavjik from Greater Toronto Area, Oshawa, Canada. Uh, I most enjoyed your talks uh, because each have a little details that you actually pick on once you more think about the subject. So that is very good, and especially in view of the development of her too. What always intrigued me is that we know that tumors are heterogeneous. We have a definition that 30% of tumor should be positive or whatever. But when I ask people, do you ever test two blocks on a larger tumor? They say no. So did anybody in all these things ever thought that there might be a place where you have equivocal results that maybe the second block might be revealing? So I, uh, Please I go to the microphone. Yeah. I have a 
have a question for you. Are you talking about two blocks on the core biopsy or on no. the final excision specimen? No, on mm. excision. On so, excision. Okay. So there, uh, when you go on to look for PubMed for some of the sources for these, uh, um, uh, there is a, uh, there are a lot of studies actually on the intratumoral and intertumoral heterogeneity that has been described. You know, uh, I think at this point, uh, to put it into a nutshell, there's not a lot of advantage of doing it on two, two core, uh, two uh, blocks, picking up two blocks. You pick up the best block where it's fixed well, and you know, uh, that's what you do, but if it's negative and if it's showing a little bit more heterogeneous staining, I think uh, the block need to be selected is less of DCIS, more of the invasive cancer, away from the biopsy side. So these are some of these criteria that you can use to select the block to do it, uh, but there's uh, no hard evidence of picking on two blocks and doing it. So you'd rather compare it with a prior core biopsy, which is, might be fixed well. So, you know, um, any, any I, thoughts I on the process? Hi there, uh, Ann Mills from UVA. Uh, my question is about reporting. Uh, so we have recently moved from doing ish first with reflex to IHC to the reverse in response to this. Um, but I'm still trying to help navigate uh, how we should word our one plus cases. They have historically, our quick text says negative parentheses one plus. And I've been sort of personally changing mine to say low, but I realized I don't know if this is the best approach or whether we should keep the term, you know, whether we ought to really be changing our reporting to read low parentheses one plus versus keeping it negative, knowing that they will see the one plus and acknowledge that that's low. So I'm curious if you all have guidance there. So um, I, the, the simplest answer I can give you is that I'm not going to change my practice until my neighbor, Dr. Christina Jensen, <laughs> changes, okay? So if she says, okay, let's do it, then I'll do it, okay? okay. So I need guidelines to explain to my uh, oncologists and surgeons, okay? So, uh, and part of it is also the patient population is, uh, it's become much smarter with the social media stuff and everything. So if you start to, mm, uh, you know, the drug <laughs> uh, uh, therapies have been approved much faster, just like the PDL one you know? You, and then we are still here trying to get up the ladder so fast to understand what's going on. How do we explain to our uh, uh, physicians, okay? So I think to me, um, it's uh, important first thing is to have a dialogue with your breast group, you know, this is what it is, and also wait for the CAP ASCO guidelines for guidance, uh, how we word these things, but it's important to recognize that process and see how how, what's our incidence of the low HER2 in our group? You know, and have a HER2 interpretation thing among your scoring among the pathologists to see who is counting more zeros and who one plus, and you can do that analysis. But as of now, I uh, I will wait for a good at least I can say CAPASCO. So you know, this is what it is. So otherwise, we will be explaining everything to them. You know, in that. Got it. Process. So you still say negative parentheses one plus. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Dr. Bui or Dr. Pascota, do you all have yes, different views? Yes, I, I agree with that view, and I would just add a few more details. So that's the conversation between your breast pathologist and the, the medical group, and there is a standard care, which is ASCO, CAP guideline, but if you are in an academic institution, you have the leadership role, and if you feel like certain reporting will benefit your patient care, we will follow your example, and please publish those results, because if the CEP and ASCO want to change the guideline, they need evidence, and please provide those evidence, because we need people to lead us to, to get to the next step. I agree. Hi, I'm Michael Ross from Atrius Health in Boston. Uh, I just want to ask you what your methodology is for examining the slide. Do you look at 20x and then go on 40x if you suspect there's some weak, barely perceptible staining, or do you 40x for the whole slide? Uh, you know, where, how much, and how much time do you take to do this? I usually start from the low power and try to gaze where there is weak, moderate, or then only I go to 20x, then 40x, and try to scan the entire tumor that I'll stain the block with. So you, stay in the, you, you scan the entire, 
the entire block at 40x after you've scanned If it. I see some staining in low power, then only I go to high power, But you basically. can't see it at low power if it's, if it's one plus. In 10x, it is fairly vis visible, right? And then you go to 20x and 40x to the area where it is fairly visible to recognize whether that is incomplete or weak versus intense. So you, you can see one plus at 10x? No. I mean, I go sequentially. That's what I mean. I go from 4 to 10 to yeah. 20 to 40x. So if you don't see anything at 10, you go to 20, 20x. and you do the whole slide at 20? Yes. And then you don't do the whole slide at 40, 40. No, I okay, do not. Okay, so you can, see, you can see 1 plus at 20x right. Right, when yes. you confirm it at 40. Right. right. Okay, yes. that, that's what I want to know. Okay, yeah, yeah. You. We can see the 1 plus at 20x, and then the 40x is just to confirm it, it, you're actually seeing the staining, not some uh, non-specific yeah. I just want to add to the, this comment in terms of scanning. Are you actually looking at the normal elements and looking is there any staining in the normal elements and adjust the score for? Yeah, so I just want to add to what everyone has said. How I look at the HER2 stuff is that the low power view and also the 10X is like, you start off with, you have a systematic approach towards how you look at your HER2 slides. First look at your controls, external controls, if they're working or not. Then you go on the low power, just to scan a, a core biopsy or the lumpac to see if there's any edge artifact and if there's something that's unusual pattern of staining. And then you look at your internal control elements, if they're strongly or appropriately staining. And if they're not also, so that's keep note of it. And then you go on to look at the 20%, you know, 20X and uh, that's where you do it. And also to keep in mind your, what you're looking at uh, you go on to look at the H and D slides. Is what kind of tumor is this? You know, all those things have to be in your mind. Also, it's not like it's going to influence what you're looking at, but always you have to have that in your background. So, yeah. so you normally have positive elements or not? Most of the times, uh, the only times in my experience is when you have a young 45 year old with a triple negative breast cancer suddenly has come. Those are the situations with extensive necrosis and. Uh, those are the times you don't get to see them coring the, any normal elements in that. You have necrotic stuff, and that's where I don't see. Uh, but ma majority of the times, you have the, some normal uh, breast issue there. So, you know. so there, there was a big publication by... Alex. Could you please go to the microphone, because we're also recording the session? Thank you. Sorry, Alan Gown has published... I don't know when, a long time ago, the adjustment of the scoring if you have normal elements staining versus not. So that was what I was referring to, to see. So each institution can decide that they will be having no normal or whatever you decide to gauge your thing. So that was actually what I was referring yeah, to. Yeah, so I remember Dr. Gown's paper. Um, I think to me, how your controls are set, you know, and also how you control your internal control, how you want to see it, okay? So for me, it's in your face thing, a three plus is not really true. It has to be between a two plus and a three plus, you know, something you adjust your internal controls according to your external controls and scoring system, you know? So that's how, if it's a weak zero uh, staining pattern you see in a dot, that's not working properly, so. Hmm. Okay, I just want to rehearse, so, in your institution, you gauge your control, like your staining, that your normal elements are in between one and two plus. Not Is that one correct? and two plus. It's usually two plus. It, yeah, two plus. And sometimes they get to three plus, but it's pretty rare. It's a two plus. So, you know, that's what I want to see the normal control, you know, if I give a scoring to it, you know, so. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts on how you uh, do the internal controls? So some other questions that we've anticipated based on other work we've done has been around the use of image analysis. What would you say are potentially some of the drawbacks based on either existing systems or just experience using things like quantitative image analysis? So one of the resistance of using it is um, it's not a built-in. For example, we used to use the Roach Montana platform, but you have to go to another software and then, then do that and then manually transport that score 
into your report, so that's the interruption of workflow. However, there are some AI algorithms already developed pre-FDA approval, and, but in Europe, they have the FDA equivocal type of approval, so those algorithms are incorporated into the AI system. It's incorporated into the pathology workflow. So you scan your case, you get into it, and then you choose the areas of interest, you click the button, it generates certain data, and you look at it, use your pathologist, physician skill to evaluate if this score makes sense. If it does, you click on it, and this will get into your report. So that kind of very seamless process is very important for adoption. And that the pro for adopt that is not only reproducible, quantifiable, and it's good for the patient, it's also good for our reimbursement because for quantitative image analysis, there is a code. It, it gives you a little bit more than the manual scoring. So. Anyone else want to comment on image analysis? Mm -hmm. I don't have much experience with that. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I was trained as a fellow on the uh, image analysis, but when you really get into the nitty gritty of the practice of it, you know, there's so much competence in the cost effectiveness and uh, the algorithms created and the machines getting updated so fast on the uh, stuff and also having the histotext to have a dedicated histotext to scan them early in the morning so that we can get them. And the last part of it uh, is also the interpretation part as well. So we're still struggling with all these factors. Uh, you know, uh, all those things are still coming in, so we haven't really implemented the image analysis yet. Any other questions from the audience? Or we have a virtual question? We do. Mm -hmm. uh, when will CAP update the low HER2 guidelines? This is from Avina. So we are not the official representative <laughs> for the CAP. However, as a practicing pathologist, deeply involved with the CAP, and also involved with the guideline process, uh, I, I know that CAP is working very hard on it. The conversation is happening. But knowing the process, the guidelines are evidence-based. Now there is a good motivation to look at the guideline, to look for things that need to improve so we can get this community to move forward. There is a need. However, the guideline is depend on the newly published evidence. So we need to give it a little bit of time to have evidence to be able to do the literature review and then the experts will evaluate those literatures to publish the best practice recommendation. So any guideline will take time. So nobody has the crystal ball to predict, but two years is minimum before anything that is significant coming out. However, a focused guideline may take less time. So hope that's a satisfactory answer. We're, I'm just guessing as good as you, you can. <laughs> so, um, I would say just the CAP and ASCO are watching, <laughs> probably, but uh, I'm looking forward to the San Antonio, how things will evolve in the San Antonio Breast Conference in December. And meanwhile, uh, I was trying to stay really low on this low HER2 thing. Then my oncologist suddenly popped up this question last week uh, uh, saying, Mamata, there is this uh, new drug that's approved uh, HER2. So can you talk to us about this low HER2? What are we going to do in our practice? Oh, no. So you know, uh, I think you will be stepping up to talk to your oncologist because they already got the FDA approval for that. So they are on top of it, and we're still not there yet. But we know what it is. But you know, so that's where we are with the conversations with them. And so I am supposed to be giving a presentation in the next two weeks about this low HER2 to my breast group and see where it goes, and I know how this will go. Uh, they will say that some people are eligible for this, you know, so what do we do? I cannot call it low HER2, but I will comment on it saying that this might fall into this category. So 
some, I need to cut a deal with my oncologist on that for the FDA approval. So, you know, this is what I see, but probably things will uh, change for next year. The fast. other thing that we need to consider as well, the most of the studies that has been published is either in unresectable advanced breast cancer or the metastatic uh, breast cancer who has previously received um, general chemotherapy already. So I think we still need to visit the primary breast cancer heart to group to come up with a consensus guidelines that can be used by the pathologist. Fantastic. Uh, that is so true. We don't have the adjuvant, uh, um, uh, the trial was on the metastatic and unresectable, so we don't have data on the adjuvant setting, how, what percentage is this low HER2 and what we do with these and how many of them turned out to be HER2 positive. So we need more in the adjuvant setting to really think about any new recommendations. So. Right. And the bottom line is we don't really need the guideline to, to change today. We can work with our oncology group, work with our own colleagues to find a way to best help our patients. Right. If you report it as what it is now, the zero, one plus, two plus, three plus, if you do a good job in putting the right patient in the right bucket, the medical oncologist can use this information reliably to treat the patient. We don't have to wait for the guideline to help us to help the patient today. So that's the bottom line. Well, as we wrap up here, I want to remind you that ASCP has a new program called Pathology Trailblazers. We just wrapped up uh, one of these on HER2 low breast cancer, and we have a new um, offering for a new cohort of people who want to participate. So we'd encourage you to either join or to let others within your own organization know about this, uh, because the purpose of this is to explore what, does this, what do these recent changes and updates mean for you within your own organization. Uh, someone earlier said, hey, we normally do ISH first, now we're doing um, uh, you know, IHC on certain cases. It's kind of a reverse model, if you will. Uh, but in other instances, there may be discussions where your oncologists want certain language or comments included in the reports, and so are there ways perhaps to improve on that communication and empower pathologists and lab professionals with leadership skills? So keep your eyes out for that email or come up and let us know uh, if you've got questions about that. And then also her too low as a hashtag on Twitter. Uh, we're having um, these CME Twitter chats to not only increase awareness about the latest data and the evidence, but also to engage the pathology community and to bring in others into the discussion. Uh, so we encourage you to join us for the next one, which is going to be in October, and just ha search for the hashtag her too low And uh, these will occur throughout the, the rest of this year as well as into the first part of next year. Uh, but Twitter chats is a great way to not only meet other um, people within the Twitter and pathology community, but also we find it's a great way to engage your trainees, your residents and fellows, as well as uh, medical students who are potentially interested uh, in pathology. Uh, so please keep your eyes out for these Twitter chats, as well as what we're calling tweetorials, which you can all also use and claim CME. So with that, I want to thank the panelists again. Thank you all for being here. We hope this has been a beneficial session. Please come up to us and ask us uh, additional questions if, you've, if you'd like. Uh, but thank you so much for being here today.